Okay, so today I'm going to tell you some the latest results that we have from a summer and winter crop rotation experiment and just lead on to some management um, advice. Oh, that way. Okay, so three take-home messages today, and we'll probably all have this theme, but you know, if you go away with them, that's that's great. So number one, grow wheat varieties with tolerance to Pradlecus thornii. The other thing our research is showing is that two or more resistant crops are needed when you have damaging populations of Pradlecus thornii. So that you're going to need to grow more, to, at least two resistant crops in a rotation. Um, the good thing is that uh, rotation does work. You can get po uh, thorny eye populations down to quite low, um, but we, I'll show you uh, in the experiment where the thorny eye can survive um, in low numbers. So you need to have ongoing soil testing and uh, keep an eye on the populations. Okay, so these are the root lesion nematodes. They're, I'm going to talk about um, Pradlinchus thorny eye today because it's the most commonly found nematode in the northern region. So um, our samples that were sent to our testing service, which is now closed from 2010 to um, 2013, out of about 600 paddocks, 72% of the, um, the soils had Pradlinchus thornii in, in them. So that's what I'll we'll focus on today. So these are the nematodes. They're about half a millimetre long. They live in the soil and migrate into the roots where they do all the damage that um, Jeremy has just spoken about. Um, these are self-fertile females. We occasionally see a male, but they're quite rare and we get a little bit excited when we see them down the microscope. Um, and the damage that they can do to the roots as they feed and reproduce and damage the roots so cause up to about 65% to yield loss in intolerant wheat varieties. Okay, nematologists talk about two separate things with plants. We talk about tolerance, which is um, plants that can yield well when Pradlinchus thornii is present. The opposite is intolerance. And then a resistant, a, a separate mechanism is resistance. So a resistant plant doesn't allow thornii to reproduce and populations to increase. So the opposite there is um, a susceptible plant that allows populations to increase. So you can have crops that are tolerant, like some of our best wheat varieties, but they're susceptible. So their um, tolerance and resistance don't necessarily go together. So I'm going to go over a summer crop rotation trial that I did recently. Um, in, it's a Pradlinchus thornii site. And I'll show you a few graphs that look like this. Down this side, we have soil depth down to about 150 centimetres. Across here, we have thornii populations per kilo of soil. So I had two sites that were on the same cropping strip, but they had different cropping histories, which I'll tell you in a minute. So there's one site that I'm going to call the low thornii site, less than about 125 nematodes per kilo of soil, down to about 60 centimetres. It's getting pretty low there. The other site um, is the moderate thornii site, um, populations between 3,000 and 2,000, all the way down to about um, 60 to 90 centimetres, but the nematodes are present to 120 centimetres. Okay, so at the low site, um, the land that we were um, using had had five successive resistant crops or partially resistant crops since 2004. So that was cotton, sunflower and maize. At the moderate site, we had a, a wheat sorghum uh, wheat rotation. That's one we used to deliberately build up nematode populations. So in December 2011, we planted several varieties of mung beans, soybeans, sorghum, maize, sunflower, and we had a bare fallow, a treatment, bare fallow treatment as well to compare the results to. And then in 2013, we planted the intolerant wheat variety Streslecki of the top of the, um, all of the plots, and we had a tolerant variety Wiley. Now at this point I should say that uh, we had some soil um, chemical analysis done, and between the two sites they were very similar. Um, before each of the times that we planted the summer crops or the winter crops, we were adding about 100 kilograms of N before we planted. And the soil water between the two sites was um, uh, not significantly different. Okay, so let's start with the low thorny eye site. And I'll just tell you this and then we'll leave the low thorny eye site alone. So again, soil depth, number of nematodes. First thing to notice is that very low populations of nematodes. Here's the starting population. Um, and here's one month after we grew the summer crops. There were no significant differences between any of the summer crops or varieties, so I've just shown you the mean data here. Um, so really, not much happened in that site. The population stayed low, the nematodes are present to about 60 centimetres. So now I'll move to the moderate thorny eye site. Okay, so this is the moderate thorny eye site, one month after harvest of the summer crops. Soil depth, 
numbers of nematodes. First thing to notice is that the nematodes are present to um, 90 to 100, or, yeah, 90 to 120 centimetres. We've got this grey wobbly line, sorry my arm's moving, <laughs> and that's the fallow treatment. And there's no significant difference between fallow and the sunflower, maize and sorghum varieties. But the mung bean and soybean are susceptible, populations increase compared to the, the fallow treatment. So what I'm going to do now is just focus where the numbers are biggest, just to scare you, um, at 0 to 15 centimetres. So again, we've got the moderate thorny eye site and the thorny eye just at 0 to 15 centimetres. Here's the fallow treatment. Um, now, it's at around about, um, it's the same starting populations. So I think that question came up before. So here's some land that's been in fallow for a long time. Nematode populations are stable. So we've got varieties of sunflower, maize and sorghum here. None of those varieties are significantly different to the fallow. So you'd be pretty confident that um, of these varieties that we have here, they're not going to allow nematode populations to increase. With the mung bean, these varieties are susceptible. Populations have increased between uh, two and four <coughs> times. There's the new um, mung bean variety, Jade AU. It's susceptible, populations have increased. Uh, there's crystal as well. I guess something positive that's come out of this is that uh, emerald appears to be at least partially resistant or resistant just looking at uh, this soil depth and it's not significantly different to the fallow. Now soybeans are very susceptible. Um, this population here has increased seven times. Uh, these are about a fourfold increase. Again, there's one variety that is not as susceptible as the others, Soya 791, not significantly different to the fallow. Okay, the other thing we measured in this experiment was the yield and biomass of the summer crops between the two sites, the moderate site and the low um, P. thornii site. And there were no differences in the biomass of the yield. Uh, so you can say that these summer crops that we tested and the varieties were tolerant. But the thing to remember is that the mung beans and soybeans are symptomless. Here's one of the soybean crops. You can't tell that the nematodes have increased seven times under that plot there. So that's just something to remember. There's a, wheat is one of the varieties, or well, one of the crops where you might see some symptoms, but these variety uh, crops, no symptoms. Okay, so we'll stop here for a take-home message before we go on to the next part of it. So um, number one, all the crops tested were tolerant, but that means that there was no yield loss detected, but there were no symptoms. So there's no obvious sign you need to test your soil for nematodes. Sorghum, maize, and sunflower were resistant or partially resistant and mung bean and soybean are susceptible. They allowed nematode populations to increase, which will carry forward to the next crop, which is what I'm going to talk about now, the impact of those nematode populations on the next wheat crop. Okay, so 2013, we planted Streslecki, which is intolerant, Wiley, which is tolerant on the low and moderate sites. I'll just show the means after the summer crops. First thing to take away, oh, here we go. We've got yield here in kilograms per hectare, and we've got the moderate thorny eye site low thorny eye site. First thing to take away is that Wiley is tolerant, its yield was the same with both starting, um, different starting populations of thorny eye. With Streslecki, losing about 47% yield when it was grown on the site that started with higher damaging populations of Pradalekid's thorny eye. And it's probably reached its yield potential here. So that's a good thing, management works. We've grew a nice crop of Streslecki. And here's what the plots look like. I hope you can still see it. <laughs> so this is Streslecki on the low thornii site, very low populations of Pradolenchus thornii after sunflower, yielding 3.7 uh, tonnes per hectare. It looks nice. On the moderate thornii site after soybean, populations were 12,000 per kilo of soil. This plot only yielded the equivalent to 1.6 tonnes per hectare. And these are the symptoms that you might see in wheat in an in intolerant variety. So there's lower leaf yellowing, gaps between the rows, we've got stunted, unthrifty plants, and they might look um, water and nutrient um, deficient. Okay, so we're at the moderate thorny eye site and we're just looking at the yields of Streslecki. The highest yields of Streslecki, which still aren't very high, are after the fallow, sunflower and maize um, uh, crops. The lowest was after soybean, and the difference between the highest and lowest is a 21% yield loss. So putting a very susceptible crop into this rotation, um, you know, you'll suffer yield loss with an intolerant variety. Now, if anyone is still awake and listening, you'll be saying, hang on, I thought that sorghum was um, resistant. 
and it's a good crop to include. But we, what we have here is no difference between sorghum and mung bean. Well, the, the yield of Streslecki is not different after sorghum and mung bean. I think this is due to two things. It was quite a dry year when we um, drew, grew the summer crops and when we grew this Streslecki it was relatively dry, which has limited nematode um, multiplication. So I think these um, nematode, the nematode populations after mung bean were quite conservative. Um, the other thing that I think this is saying is that just growing one resistant crop in a sequence really isn't enough. If we'd had two sorghum crops in a row, we might have seen a, a better result there. But that's the intolerant variety. So let's look at what happens when you grow the tolerant variety, Wiley. Losing, if you had grown Streslecki instead of Wiley, losing between 43 to 55% of your yield. So it's a bit of a no-brainer, um, grow a tolerant wheat variety. All right. So just putting all this data together from the moderate site at 0 to 15 centimetres. So I've got thorny eye population 0 to 15. So here's Wiley. Its um, yield hasn't changed as nematode populations have increased. So that's tolerance. But what we have here with Streslecki, the intolerant variety, is um, just with this set of data, about a 20% yield loss between the, the lowest populations and the highest populations at um, uh, the moderate site. If we put all the data together from both the low thorny eye site and the high thorny eye site, um, you can see that the low um, thorny eye site is uh, clumping here. Again, we've got um, Wiley here. It's tolerant. It's yielding about well, a bit more than 3.5 tonnes per hectare, um, irrespective of what the nematodes are doing. And the other thing I'll just point out here is I've got some back transform data. The lowest point here is equivalent to 13 thorny eye per kilo of soil. The highest point here is equivalent to um, 7,600. Um, but it's also worth noting that we get our best results when we look at the nematodes all the way through the profile. So um, uh, the, the nematodes at 0 to 15 centimetres will tell you something about what's going to happen to the next crop. But we guess get our best relationships by looking all the way through the, the soil profile. OK. So that's tolerance. Um, so I've talked about Wiley, but there are other tolerant varieties. Um, there's information on NVT online, or the new uh, wheat variety guide has just come out, and I've got some copies here. Come and grab one. Um, so I've talked about Wiley. If we could look at the other varieties that are listed as tolerant in the variety guide, uh, one that the guys I work with are a bit excited about is Lancer. It seems to be out yielding Wiley. And this percentage here is um, Wiley has traditionally been our most tolerant variety, and we just compare varieties um, compared to Wiley. So Lance is doing well here. Other tolerant varieties are Sunguard, Suntop, Gauntlet, Gregory, Burke, and Eaglehawk. Okay, so I'll just tell you where there, there is more information available. If you go to page six on, in this um, wheat variety guide, there's a lot of information, but I just want to focus on the um, information about uh, thorny eye and neglectus. Uh, sorry, Pradlinkus thorny eye. So in there on page six, there's a column for Pradlinkus thorny eye tolerance and Pradlinkus thorny eye resistance. So these are the, the boxes here in green. They're the tolerant varieties that I just highlighted in the previous slide. And they're the ones that you want to choose when you find you've got um, Pradlinkus thorny eye present. The other thing to notice is the thorny eye resistance. So that's the number of nematodes the nematodes will increase in population. All of the varieties here, there are, there's no green boxes. All of the varieties are susceptible. Um, now, these are results are from, uh, from at least four years of glasshouse testing. And in the glasshouse, we provide ideal conditions for the nematodes, so they're very happy. The temperature, water, and nutrients are perfect for the nematodes. So if you like, these might be very conservative um, and safe measures of resistance or susceptibility. But if you have a good year with lots of soil water and you've got lots of happy plants, lots of happy roots, the nematodes are also happy. And potentially, these are the sorts of nematode population increases that you might see. OK. Um, the other thing I just want to talk about, I guess there's a bit of discussion in, about, um, in the area about this, the relationship between those glasshouse uh, resistance ratings that I just showed you and are in page six in that variety guide and field resistance. Um, so what we have here is our long-term uh, reproduction factors from the glasshouse experiments. High, we've got nice, happy nematodes here. The reproduction factors are the number of times the nematode populations increase. 
what we have here is some results from a field experiment with 18 varieties in a replicated trial where every plot was sampled before and after planting. Um, again, what we're finding is the nematodes from 0 to 90 centimetres all the way through the profile are giving us the best relationships. So we've got a significant interaction between um, our glasshouse ratings and our field resistance. As you can see, the resistance reproduction factors here are quite low, which is what we'd expect in the field. It, these are results from 2013. It was quite a dry year. And also the nematode, the reproduction factors tend to go down if you look at a, a 0 to 15 slice of the soil. Uh, let's add lots of stuff here. All right, so um, these are the varieties that were, uh, have been plotted here. So we've got our very susceptibles up the top here. Uh, we've got our ones that are decreasing in susceptibility. And what have I got next? Ah, this is the exciting stuff. These are the resistant rinds. These are the, ref the future of um, the wheat varieties in our region. So John and Jason Sheedy, John Thompson and Jason Sheedy have a project looking at uh, pre-breeding and releasing lines like these to the breeding companies. Um, so these ones are rated as resistant. They're not allowing the nematode populations to increase. And this is where we, where we want to head. Now, if anyone else is awake and you're, someone's talking amongst themselves, they're going, hang on, Spitfire's in the wrong place. <laughs> um, <and> yes. <laughs> Spitfire is funny and I think some results that even when Stephen talks about the rust you'll say oh Spitfire's got a little asterisk next to it again. So uh, Spitfire, that's a provisional rating from us. Um, Stephen has some opinions about Spitfire, I'll let him say it. And we'll, we'll continue to work on Spitfire and give an updated rating when we get there. Uh, if we take out Spitfire we get an even nicer um, relationship between glasshouse ratings and field. All right, time to finish up. So the take-home message is grow a tolerant wheat variety or risk losing up to 50% of your yield. In our experiment, one resistant crop was not a quick fix. It didn't uh, reduce population sufficiently. Um, growing several resistant crops does work. We had nice crops of Streslecki, um, but oh, hang on. Uh, populations of thornii don't die out completely. You need to have ongoing soil testing to keep an eye on the nematode populations. And this will come up when Rob does his little talk too. I'd just like to thank Alex Gwynn for a very generous use of his farm and, of course, the support from his family as well. We've had Prue and May who've been um, tireless helpers and, of course, Carrie Bell has done all the analysis and without her, we wouldn't be able to present it all. <laughs> okay, thank you. Barley is susceptible to Pradlanchus thornii, so um, it's quite tolerant. Um, whereas we think it might lose a, a little bit of yield, but at this point it, it just grows and looks beautiful, but the populations will be building up. So they're there to affect future intolerant varieties. Um, we've done other work where we've seen um, up to 20% yield loss in some of the older varieties of chickpeas. So we'll be doing some more work on that to see what the current, how, how the chickpeas are going. It's um, a poor host of both, so at, at least partially resistant or resistant to both Pradlanchus thornii and Neglectus. So a, a good crop. The numbers crop. won't build up, but they can... They might stay at a stable level, yeah. <laughs> uh, canola, is, sorry. <laughs> um, it's susceptible to Pradlanchus neglectus, so populations will build up if you've got Neglectus, but resistant to thornii. So a good crop to include in rotations where you've got thornii. Uh, 